Today's episode is sponsored by Jung Seed Company. Jung Seed Company has the largest selection of annual and perennial flowers and plants online. They are a family owned and operated company since 1907. Use code 15FG podcast to receive 15% off your order at jungseed.com. That's J U N G S E E D.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins, Associate Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Good morning, Carol. I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the Executive Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. It's so nice to meet you. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing great. 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 Is that because we have a particularly <laughs> exciting topic to discuss today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love this topic. So it's not your typical ground covers. That's that's the theme. So what would you say is a typical ground cover? What do you, you think? You know, like everything that pops to mind is an invasive. Like, <laughs> oh, seriously, like Vinca, Pachysandra. What else pops to mind? Like those are, those I feel like are the typicals. Um, maybe Sweet Woodruff, you know, which is like a non-invasive or Creeping Time. And let, let me be clear, like those last two almost made it onto my list. So <laughs> I don't know how not atypical my, my list is, but I, I tried really hard. Um, I got a peek at your list. You did good. Girl. Oh, thank you. I was, I was really like you. I was like, everything I want to do is maybe a little typical. And maybe these are. But I mean, I think you have to keep it in the category of things that work as ground covers, right? So yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, not every low growing plant is a ground cover. Yeah, I, I know that seems kind of silly to actually say out loud. But you know, in my mind, it needs to be something that, you know, really it like hugs the ground is capable of smothering out you know weed intrusion is not is is not aggressive though you know it's not something that's gonna just envelop and eat everything in its path like the blob from the 1970s movie you know it's it's that that really fine line that a ground cover has to walk and uh yeah, so it was it was not easy, but but I was very impressed by your list. So give me what uh, number one. What was like the first thing that popped to mind, and you were like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing that one." So I this one is a favorite of mine, and I I think it's sort of a crowd favorite. It was perennial plant of the year, and I don't know what 2013 or something like that. It's variegated Solomon seal, and so that's polygonite polygonatum or polygonatum odoratum variegatum and that is it's super hardy hardy from zones three to nine so huge range on this one um it likes partial to full shade which is great like be, you know i think it's sometimes hard to find not hard to find ground covers that like shade but very useful um because a lot of the other ones that i thought of are really full sun type of things um it gets 18 to 24 inches wide 10 to 20 inches or 18 to 24 inches tall 10 to 20 inches wide so it, it's a little taller than it is wide but what it makes it a interesting thing for a ground cover is the roots it has these tuberous i've seen them described as finger-like they are finger-like that is a perfect and that is a perfect description oh that doesn't give you the creeps a little though i'm like oh, i mean fingers. it kind of does <laughs> yeah yeah but they kind of lock together and creep across the ground and spread slowly if you want it to spread more quickly you can dig up a clump break them up, spread them out, and they'll cover even more territory. I've had one, I, I got it as a Mother's Day present, like I wanna say maybe seven or eight years ago, and I have given away probably 
seven or eight divisions from the original parent. I've also moved some into dry shade, which I didn't know if it would work there. Um, under my PG hydrangea, it was really quite dense and not a lot of water gets down to that root zone area. And it was fine, totally fine. So if you look this up, it says that it wants moist soil and maybe it does, but I found that at least in my dry shade conditions, it, it, it was maybe grew a little less tall, but still fine. Um, it flowers in the spring, but the flowers are really not very noticeable. There's small little pairs of white bell flowers that hang down below the foliage. And it's really the foliage that is the main attraction. And that lasts all season long from spring right through until fall. And it's these ovate leaves. They're alternating across the stem, these arching stems. And the stems have a sort of a lovely rosy blush to them sometimes. And then it looks like someone took and painted a little white just sort of randomly around the edges. It's very artistic. And in the shade, that variegation really pops. Super cool. Um, no diseases that I've ever seen. Um, the deer, they have tried like once or t twice to take a bite out of it. And it's so fibrous that they, they got like a little bit of one leaf and then they gave up and went away. <laughs> They're like, where's that hosta? Give me that hosta. <laughs> right? I'm, yeah. I'm moving on. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and if my deer don't care for it, then I'm, I think it's pretty safe for most other people's deer. Um, yeah. So just, just a cool, easy, and shareable plant that if you, if you want to cover some ground, it does a lovely job. It, yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan. I have a patch um, that this will give you an idea. It, okay, so it's in dry shade, but at a certain point in time, we switched our heating source and we now are heating uh, via propane. So one of those giant 100 pound propane tanks got plopped on top of my patch, a variegated Solomon seal. And it didn't skip a beat. It grew <laughs> all around the tank. And actually now I noticed the other day that there's a foot on the tank that they're growing out from underneath the foot of this 100 pound propane tank in dry shade. Um, clearly not great conditions. And it's still, it's looking awesome. I'm like, wow. And and it even picks up on the white of the tank in the leaves. I mean, you know. <laughs> That's a captivating combo right there. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Look for that in your next issue of Fine Garden. Gardening. Totally, totally. But yeah, I, I feel like we, we don't talk about that. You know, slightly taller plants can make really nice ground covers. And that's that's a great example of one. Um, I'm going to go in the totally opposite direction with a plant that doesn't get more than maybe two inches tall. Um, but I think perhaps this is one of the most underrated um, native ground covers out there. And it's partridge berry. So that's Michella ripens or ripens uh, zones three to eight. So a fairly a very wide range, if you will. This is a northeastern and central North American native. Um, it is very common in the Great Lakes area, and it really likes the Atlantic coastal pine barrens. So, you know, hey, New Jersey, I'm talking to you and up and into Connecticut where we are. This is something that you will see growing native in your partial to full shade areas. So it really likes that shady spot. It likes um, kind of that woodland humusy type of soil, but it is drought tolerant. Um, so during those time periods in the native lands when we don't get a ton of rain this this little guy persists but um i've seen uh when i did some research on this plant that i've always really just taken for granted because it seeded itself into my shade garden and now makes a lovely little ground cover that it will take average soil wet soil dry soil and it even some people even said that it doesn't really care about ph so i mean that's a pretty tough little guy um this is a perfect alternative to the vinca vine that we were talking about to myrtle if you know you know myrtle and you're really into it um but far more well behaved and i already said it's only one to two inches tall and usually spreads out to be about 14 inches wide or so 
wiry stems with these beautiful little white or excuse me green teardrop shaped leaves to it that are I believe they're alternating they might actually be opposite but check the show notes for a photo just to double check me on that with a slight little white line down the middle of the leaves um this is an evergreen so amazing um get a beautiful white star flower in spring which um pollinators do love particularly blowflies i had heard are very into that so all right great blowflies <laughs> i'm excited but anywho you know those those really early bloomers uh, are so important for the native pollinators, especially because there's not much else going on. Um, and then that little white star flower gives way to a red berry, a very hard, not very palatable red berry that persists through the winter. So you can imagine this is like you know, if ever there was a little plant that's like the Christmas plant, it would be this beautiful little red berries on this evergreen ground cover. Um, so I, I would call this a great living mulch. You know, this is something that's going to politely fill in that understory of all of your shady perennials, fill in between without choking out, really not being aggressive, and just give you some nice cover all across the, the garden. It is deer and rabbit resistant as well. Um, and I'm going to start doing this thing, which I didn't tell Carol about, but I'm going to start trying to give you guys sources for some of the plants that we talk about because in, when we're doing research on on these plants that we love and we recommend to you a lot of times we end up doing a lot of resources at the nurseries and mail order nurseries that carry these plants so if you're looking for this partridge berry which is amazing there's a great native plant nursery called rare roots um, from the southeast and they have this in stock um, and that's an area which you could source this plant if it's something that interests you. Um, so again, that's partridge berry. I don't have a bad thing to say about it. I just love it so much. Okie dokie, Carol. Um, I'm excited because I got a preview, as I said. I didn't cheat. Okay, for everybody listening, this is not cheating. It just so happens whoever goes in first and puts their plant list in, which is usually Carol because she's far more responsible than me, I get to see their list in advance. So um, I'm excited to see what number two is that you walk out to the audience. And, you know, the, the other thing, though, Danielle, is we have to make sure we're not covering the same plants. Wouldn't that exactly. be embarrassing? Yeah. Exactly. That would be totally embarrassing. That has never happened, I don't think, in all the years. Not yet, although our experts sometimes do yes. cover a similar plant or the same plant, but yeah, yes. but, but it's because we're good, good, diligent people and we check each other's plants. Right, list. right. We don't totally cheat. Not, it's not totally cheating. Totally not cheating. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got a fun one. It's kind of a... Um, an unfriendly little plant, but very beautiful. And that is Eastern <laughs> Prickly Pear Cactus. I feel like I have so many people in my life that I would describe that way. <laughs> unfriendly, but beautiful. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. And you know, it's funny, like long ago, before I was involved with fine gardening at all, I had a friend whose grandmother had this, she had this little postage stamp garden in, inside of the city of Pittsburgh. And she planted this to keep the dogs from doing their business on her garden. And I am sure it worked. Yes, that is amazing. <laughs> okay, I'll stop interrupting now. Sorry. <laughs> so, Opuntia humifosa, that zones four to nine. I've seen like multiple sources saying that we're supposed to be saying, Opuntia, Opuntia, oh. um, but I've never heard anyone actually call it that, but um, so I don't know if that's more correct, but I'm going to say Opuntia. Um, it, it likes full sun, well-drained soil. In fact, it, it will do just fine in sandy, gravelly, like dry, horrible soil, which is why I've always wanted to grow this plant. And I must admit that I, ne I haven't gotten it yet, but really it is still on my top of my wish list. Um, it, it likes to grow on slopes again for the drainage. It is not okay with wet soil. That's the one problem you would have is if you put it in wet soil, it will rot. 
Um, it's native to the eastern U.S. It goes up into Canada. It goes all the way down to Florida, parts of the Midwest. So really big native range. And for those of you in the West, you all there are other um, native opuntias, opuntias that you can use in, in much a, a similar way. It's a perennial, it's evergreen. Although I must say in the winter time, it looks kind of bad. It, the, the, mm. the little pads kind of flop down on the ground and they shrivel up and they maybe change color a little and you think, oh gosh, this is it, it's done. It's not coming back. The dogs are gonna have their way with grandma's garden. <laughs> but in the spring, it parks back up again and it makes the most amazing flowers. And that's the thing that you, like in the spring when it starts, you'll see this on social media. People that have it will you know, post these amazing photos of the flower, dis flower display. It's um, a golden, buttery yellow with deeper mm -hmm. colored centers, the pollinators love it. Um, the plant itself is segmented round or oval pads instead of leaves. And on those pads are sometimes spines and also these clusters of little woolly hairs called glaucids. And they and are the word- deadly. They are the work of the devil, y'all. Like these things, you, if, if you get them into your skin, it's hard to get them out. Heaven help you. If you rub your eye, um, you might need to go to the doctor. Oh, you will uh, need to go to the doctor. Right? Uh, because they, they get into your skin and there's some kind of little hook at the end that makes it hard to get them back out. The tip is scotch tape or packing tape. Put it mm -hmm. over rip it off, do this multiple times, you might get them mostly out. Um, but I think that's the main reason why I haven't really like jumped at the chance to establish this in this garden because I'm like, I am sure that I'm gonna injure myself on this plant. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's, it's just such a cool plant. It is so cool that we can grow a cactus year round in the Northeast or upper Midwest. Um, so it may be worth a little bit of suffering <laughs> to, to have a plant right. like this. Right. Yeah, it is so cool. And there is just such a wide variety. Carol, I know you spent a lot of time last year out in Colorado. And I think the most uh, impressive collection of apuntias that I have seen was actually out in Colorado and um, in some of these rock gardens and crevice gardens that that folks had, um, you know, obviously different species um, out there. But yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Sometimes they get, you know, different species have a purple cat. To, to the to the pads or you know bright 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 pink flowers and yeah just a very very cool plant overall um but holy cow those spines <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think scotch tape is generous. I think, you know, duct tape you might need or that gorilla tape that true, you know, you rip your first layer of skin off, but you'll get you'll get the spines as well. Um, well, I'm going to go with a softer, more velvety, more friendly, <laughs> large leafed ground cover. And um, that's wild ginger or Canadian wild ginger. And I am, I'm going to go for the native this time, you guys. Um, and that's a serum uh, canadense and it's zones three to eight. You've heard me talk before about the European version, which is a serum uh, Europe, European, European, um, which I truly i like a little bit better as a friendly garden plant because it's not as aggressive it's not as much of a spreader um and it's a little bit smaller and well behaved um with a shinier leaf however Canadian wild ginger, if you're looking for a ground cover this is a good one um it is a dry shade lover so if you guys are looking for things to plant underneath well-established trees that tend to suck the soil moisture dry and everything you've tried underneath that tree has not worked, try Canadian wild ginger. It's obviously with a common name like that, it's native to Canada. Well, it's native from Manitoba all the way to North Carolina. So that's a pretty wide range. Um, and I was very impressed to see that it actually still held up into solidly into zone eight, which was kind of interesting to find out. Um, prefer shade to partial shade. 
and its preference is generally moist, well-drained soil. I would say you're going to have to do a good job of getting this established for perhaps for its first year or two before you let it, you know, go to its own devices in a dry shade situation. And then you're pretty much okay. Um, these are large leaves, six inches in diameter with a almost completely round with a little dip at the end where the uh, leaf petiole attaches to the stem. Looks like a lily pad, a bright Kelly green with a nice velvety kind of fuzz to it, um, which makes it deer resistant, which is very interesting. Um, anything with that fuzz tends to be a plant that deer avoid. Rabbits as well, allegedly. I have not put it to the test. I've got my first rabbit population happening right now. Hooray! <laughs> um, and so far they haven't touched mine, but this is the first year I've really dealt with rabbits, so I'll report back on that. But in the research, it said both rabbit and deer resistant for this wild ginger. Um, I would say the coolest thing about this plant is that it is a larval host for the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So... I decided that I had to put a, a photo of the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars on our show notes. These are so cool looking. They look like they're from outer space. Um, so go to our show notes at finegardening.com. You guys know the drill. Our plant lists are there. Photos are there. Click on that podcast tab. You'll get right to the this episode. And these caterpillars, all right, first of all, they're stark black. They have crazy orange dots on them, like they're from the, you know, a different planet. They have crazy, crazy antennae that are constantly moving in that dark black chocolate. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with sharing my wild ginger with them because they'll, you know, they'll cause some leaf damage and foliar damage, but they're eating. It's a finite period of time. That's what they're doing right now. In about a week or two, they pupate, they form their chrysalis, and then of course, you get to see the pipe vine swallows actually hatch. So, you know, don't discount a lot of these ground covers that I was coming across, not only for pollinator, you know, pollinators being able to feed on them, but a lot of ground covers, especially native ground covers, happen to be also larval hosts for a lot of pollinators. So, yeah, that pipe vine swallowtail is pretty cool. Um, and uh, Prairie Moon Nursery, uh, another amazing native nursery that Carol, I know you've ordered from quite a bit, um, carries uh, this Canadian wild ginger, very reasonable, sizable plants from what I saw online. So it's a, it's a really, really good plant. Um, and yeah, it masses out. I don't even think I talked about how big it gets, but this is a, this is a plant that's going to get up to about a, a foot to a foot and a half tall. So it's a little bit taller and it said two to three feet wide, but it definitely spreads out and takes up about as much space as you'll give it. So figure that you want to space these at least three feet on center if you want it to fill in and make this really velvety green understory to your shady spots. That's so cool. I should mention that the uh, Eastern Prickly Pear, also available from Prairie Moon Nursery, and they'll sell you the pads so you can grow a prickly pear from a single pad, it'll, it'll root. And so that's a very affordable way to buy it and an easy way to propagate it. And Prairie Moon and several other places, I'm sure, also carry this, but the thing that's notable about them is that they'll, they'll sell you as many pads as you want. That's so Prairie cool. Moon. Just make yeah. sure you put on your welder's gloves when you unpackage it. <laughs> 100%. All right. Well, geez, you guys are just getting so much good info today about pollinators and we're giving you sources for plants. I mean, this is, I feel like this is, this is worth its weight in gold, this podcast, this free podcast. <laughs> Carol, what is your next ground cover? unusual okay. this one is unusual because it's a little bigger than most ground covers um but apparently it is smaller than the rest of the species apparently okay. pixie periwinkle baptisia that's Cute. baptisia australis pixie periwinkle hardy from zones four to nine 
And reportedly, this is a dwarf cultivar, grows two to three feet tall and wide, um, full sun, well-drained soil, very drought tolerant once it's established. Um, I bought this thinking, you know, that it would be two feet tall and wide. It, it is definitely, and I bought three plants because it was <laughs> going to be this charming little vignette with it's like kind of on the ground next to the larger Baptisias. Um, they got pretty big and I, <laughs> they're definitely, each plant is definitely at least three feet tall and wide and they sort of grew together. So we're now covering an area that is at least 10 feet across in both <laughs> directions. So I'm covering like, what, what is that? 200 square feet? No, 100 was, square feet. Yeah, 10 by 10, 10, 10 by 10. Yeah. yeah, 100 square feet with the three plants. So, okay, I'm covering ground with it. That's super. And I'm not salty that it's not small anymore because it is very beautiful. I bet. Um, I bet. All right. Okay. So good for erosion control, you know, because some yeah. ground covers you do. You want to cover a lot of ground for erosion purposes or, yes. you know, a more neglected area of the property. Yes. And and it keeps the weeds down for sure. And it has that wonderful prairie look. It goes great with grasses. Um, it has the same as as many of the others in the species do the the compound foliage it look like you know kind of bluish clovers very pretty and the flowers themselves are like the the p-shaped flowers that are um like a lovely lavender bluish lavender little white in them and i put a dropped a photo in the sh show notes because when it's in flower it really is the best time of year um so there's a photo of it in flower in the show notes but after it's done blooming it holds its foliage just perfectly the whole rest of the season it really has like a shrub rate like presence um uh, but at the end of the season you can cut it to the ground uh and it starts from scratch the next year. The Baptisias as a genus are all native to North America. There are 20 different species. I thought that maybe Pixie Periwinkle was a hybrid, but it's not. It is just a selection from B Baptisia australis, which mm -hmm. is native to the Eastern and Central US, uh, extending up into Central Canada very carefree, very long lived. And Baptisias in general are super long lived. You, you set it and forget it. You put it in, don't have to worry about it dying back or, you know, I haven't had it seed around, which some of the other species do seed a bit, but this one hasn't done that. Um, it, the, it has the early flowers. So this, it flowers in spring, like mid to, mid to late spring, which is a time in the season when there isn't a lot else going on. So the bumblebees especially love it. And um, yeah, it's, it's super, super cute, super useful, not easy to move. If you don't like where you put it, I don't know what you do, but you, you're not gonna probably dig it out and move it. But the, its root system is, is super strong and also helps to add nitrogen into the soil. So. Um, it's beneficial in, in, in many ways. I think it's really good. It builds a good um, culture in the soil around it for, for the soil dwelling organisms, which we are all trying to support. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't 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 plant any Baptisia where you don't want it to be, because I I still have PTSD from we did an article, uh, Richard Hockey actually did a trial on Baptisias many, many years ago. And I had like this great idea that well, let's show the root system. So I was going to dig up one of my mature Baptisias and do, you know, a cool photo of it on a white background. I was sweating trying to get the intact uh, root system out. And it is I don't think it's technically considered a tap root. It's just a very fleshy, deep, deep, deep root. And uh, 
Yeah, which gives you an idea. It's got some serious drought tolerance for a plant. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, don't don't put it where you don't want it. But I love that you're like, it's a pixie. And it's like, no, it is three and a half feet tall. <laughs> yeah, it's like a pixie. <laughs> Exactly. Pixie with a little bit of steroids. Oh, so funny. All right. Um, I'm going to go into a plant that I'm not currently growing. But have you ever had a plant that just like everywhere you look within a given amount of time, say a year or so, Carol, that you, you see it everywhere. And it's like, it keeps popping up. Like it's, it's popping up into your feed. You see it in a garden, you go to photograph. Somebody mentions it. All of a sudden it's in an article in Fine Gardening. Like, has that happened to you? Oh, all the time. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> all the time. So it's I, like I, once you notice it, you just start, you keep seeing it, right? I, I feel like that's it. And uh, for me, it's it's Pacara. Pacara aurea is haunting me. Like, I feel like this, this plant wants to be my friend. I, I feel like it's a stalker at this point, this plant. Um, it's also known as golden ragwort. Um, I don't like that name because I think people associate it with ragweed, which is in, you know, the Solidago family. Totally different plant, totally different plant. So it's also called golden ground cell. And I like that. I like golden ground cell. I think that that's a cool name. Um, this is a very cool plant. Um, anybody who's familiar with Ligularia, um, which is, is uh, a, a very cool plant that has these kind of round leaves that are a little bit heart-shaped maybe, um, yellow flowers. That's what this plant is, only the ground cover version of a Ligularia. Um, it's native to Eastern North America, all the way south to Texas. Holy macaroni. So zones three to eight B. I saw some people getting into a little bit of a tiff online about she grows it in zone nine. It's a solid zone nine. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that because <laughs> I'm sitting here in zone six going, eh, all right, I'll let you guys hash that out. But, you know, Pacara is very, it has a very extensive range. Um, so full sun to nearly full shade. And I always like reading that about a plant because I think to myself, oh, this is going to be one of those great knitter plants. You know, you can dot it in all throughout all your beds, front of the house, back of the house, on the side of the house. And it's going to give cohesion to your landscape. You know, I suffer from onesieitis, like I think a lot of gardeners do. You know, you've got a few of this, a few of that. And, you know, years go on and you think, oh, my gosh, it looks like somebody with a very chaotic mind designed this garden. Well, I'm trying to bring some more cohesiveness to my beds, but they're in a lot of different exposures. So this Pacara, you know, golden ground cell would be a great plant for that. Um. I love that Ed Lyon recommended this plant in his article that was 27, 27 better ground covers to replace problematic plants. And I'm going to drop a link to this in our show notes because I think when a lot of people, as we said at the top of the show, think about ground covers, they tend to go to the invasive, <laughs> the lily in the valleys, the pachysandras, Japanese pachysandra. And Ed actually provided this as a good alternative to lily of the valley. Um, it's one to two feet tall and wide. However, that two feet is really comes from almost uh, 12 inches of flower stem when it's in flower. So it's got this really nice kind of mounded habit of these oval or excuse me, round shaped beautiful leaves at its base and then it shoots up these little rockets in early spring um, of golden 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 daisy like flowers to it um it's a really really nice plant another time that it's haunted me recently was when we were at tower hill and mark richardson who was the director of horticulture there had recommended it as being one of his favorite plants that was currently doing its thing and um yep there it was we saw it in shade we saw it in full sun um and just approve because it does look like a shade plant that it grows in full sun i think the photo i chose to put in the show notes was it growing in full sun um Again, this is um, this is available. We talked about Prairie Moon Nursery, not to be confused with Prairie Nursery, which is a different 
uh, online source, mail order source of another native plant nursery that does have this golden ground cell um, for sale and a great source. And again, another awesome native plant nursery that Carol, I know you've also ordered from before in the past and we, and we frequently give them a big, a big shout out. But, um, also I feel like I should say like hashtag not sponsored. Like these aren't, <laughs> these aren't, these aren't sponsored plugs that we're putting in here. Um, dry shade, no problem also for gold, golden ground cell, which I'm always looking for. In fact, Ed Lyon, um, who's this brilliant horticulturist from Iowa talked about, he planted this underneath a mature stand of American linden trees, which American lindens are known to be some of the biggest water hogs as far as trees are concerned. And this was the only plant that he could plant underneath an American linden uh, grove that he had. So obviously tough as nails. Um, so let me introduce my stalker plant again. It's golden ground, ground cell. Um, it's Pacara aurea and it zones three to eight. Um, I will be getting it soon. All right, Carol, bring it on home for our not your typical ground covers final selection. Okay. So I've been, as you know, I've been getting into annuals more and more um, because of the influence of a couple of my favorite authors who are really big annuals and tropical people. So I've, I've been growing zinnias for a long time. And, and you know, like one, actually one of the very first flowers I ever grew in my life. And uh, so this is a nice little polite sized ground cover sized zinnia. Uh, from the Profusion series, which are all little polite size zinnias. It's Pro Profusion Cherry Bicolor. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, Zinnia Profusion Cherry Bicolor. It's an annual, uh, full sun, well-drained soil, likes fertile soil, but it's really not too terribly fussy. Too much mulch around the base can cause stem rot, but really that's the only problem that I know about with this plant. Otherwise, super easy to grow, like literally a child could grow it because I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> Grew my first zinnias. Okay, so seed started, you, you want to start your seed maybe six to eight weeks before your average last frost. Um, the Profusion series became available around 1999. So it's been around a while. And they, I think they started out with orange. And over the years, they've introduced various colors. They've got a doubles in the series now. Um, these are hybrids of Zinnia angustifolia and Zinnia elegans. And they are true dwarfs. They stay 12 to 18 inches tall and wide, and they flower profusely starting in midsummer. And like Z most zinnias, they hold their flowers for a tremendously long time. And what's cool about the profusion cherry bicolor, so it is a bicolor, each petal when it first opens is mostly white with a little bit of pink at the base. But as it matures, it gets pinker and pinker. And then as the new flowers are opening next to it, it has this appearance. There are multi multiple colors of flower on the same plant. Um, I actually had gotten a sample of the Profusion Red Yellow Bicolor um, from the All America Selections. And I got one plant um, to start, I think I waited a little too long. The seed was a bit old, so I got one plant and I loved it. It was so cool. The red, yellow bicolor has red and yellow and it ages to uh, like sort of apricot and orange and like a brick red and super, super, super cool. So another cool thing about the Profusion series, at least the singles with the open center is that they make seed and the seed actually comes pretty true to type. Oh, wow. Um, right. So that's not a usual thing no. for, yeah, yeah, for your annuals. Um, so I did collect seed from that. And then I went out and I bought the Profusion Cherry by color. I bought a mix with multiple other colors in it. Um, because I just find this so charming and, and it is so useful for tucking around the edges at the front of the border. Um, I have it out near the mailbox or next to the streets because you don't want things that are too 
tall growing up and then flopping out into the street. So it's great for that kind of a situation. Just really like the traditional bedding plant that people used to do with annuals where you just space them about 12 inches apart and let them do their thing. Um, it's it, the deer have left it alone. The deer in general leave zinnias alone because they have the hairy leaves. Mm -hmm. um, the rabbits have left it alone. I also am having real rabbit problems for the first time really ever. And I don't know what's going on with that, but it seems like it's not just us. It seems like the whole Eastern seaboard is having a bunny baby boom. And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hooray. <laughs> hooray, lucky us. They are super cute, they but, are. Uh, <laughs> but they don't, they don't eat zinnias even when it's bunny sized. So that's, that seems good. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't say enough about this, even though I've only really been growing this, you know, this is my first year with this cultivar. The series is fantastic and, uh, highly recommend. Definitely. So, uh, also I'm going to add to it salt tolerant because, um, so we have a, we have a family glorified fishing shack that's on Long Island Sound and the for years my mom's been growing the um I think it's profusion yellow and profusion orange which were like the classics that were first introduced and these they will grow in between the crags of a rock right on the water and get salt spray in the whole nine and obviously a ton of radiant heat off those you know those rocks that are right on the shoreline and they do great in full sun yes. so yes tough tough yes. very tough absolutely plants. same same thing in in my hell strip right next to the mailbox you know that gets salt all winter from the road yeah. no problem at all and yeah super cool yeah that I I was waiting for this one because that this was the like this was my most excited like the uh, all your plants were great sorry all your plants were great but I was very excited to hear about this one because I think that's really novel you know to say hey there is these dwarf zinnias that make a really great ground cover and I feel like a lot of times too that we look for ground covers that are going to be annual because we're looking for space fillers while other perennials and shrubs get to their mature, you know, state and you don't want to, you know, shove another perennial in there. You want to keep the space open, but not uncovered ground during that period. So yeah, I was excited about that one. That's my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to go on the on the totally opposite end. I'm going to go for a shrub. And, uh, you know, I had to. A, I had to. And B, I wanted to sing the praises of a juniper because, you know, you guys have heard me get up on my soapbox on this podcast many of times saying, let's stop hating on junipers so much. You know, I think a lot of times we hate on junipers because anything in the blue rug carpeted green carpet series those are in all those big box store parking lots and just like stelladora daylilies we started hating on those plants well those plants are tough as nails <laughs> like they're pretty spectacular plants that they can put up with that and in the right application surrounded by you know, maybe far more interesting plants or a, a mixed border and a lot of interesting other foliage junipers really hold their own um so i'm gonna go with lime glow juniper which is juniperus horizontalis lime glow it's zones three to nine um what doesn't a juniper tolerate it tolerates full sun lean soil clay sand rocks it will literally grow in rocks people <laughs> any soil ph the biggest thing that you just want to avoid with junipers is standing water. You know, they don't love sitting in wet. Um, that will cause fungal diseases with junipers. So anything else that you have, throw that at the juniper and it's going to be okay. Now I picked lime glow because I feel like we've heard a lot about, you know, blue rug junipers and that's the typical ground cover erosion control juniper that people go with. But lime glow is absolutely beautiful. It gets to be about a foot to a foot and a half tall, two to three feet wide or so. And it is just lime green with these bright acid yellow tips to it. And it's truly beautiful 
has a soft kind of stretching like wingspan to it that's what its habit is so you can picture that it's going to be you know a central stem but very much you know just spread out like it's taking flight um that's its habit it's absolutely stunning in winter that lime and kind of acid yellow goes to a golden color so really in the winter when you know not much else is going on maybe you've got some broadleaf evergreens and a few conifers this conifer really has a glow up basically and it's unbelievable um so looks good year round is a really great backdrop plant i've already mentioned erosion control this is a great plant for erosion control um it's considered a dwarf cultivar i know people get a little nervous when you know junipers either seem to be categorized as they hug the ground to only a couple of inches tall or they get monstrous and they'll take over and eat your whole garden you know like a dobbs frosted if you will this is kind of in the in in the in between. Um, it's not going to stay itty bitty, but it's going to hang out in that foot and a half to maybe two feet tall zone. Um, here's how cool this juniper is: the RHS awarded it a Plant of Merit award. The RHS people; these are like you know. These are kind of stately individuals over in the UK. <laughs> they awarded an, an award of merit to this juniper, juniper. So it's that cool. Um, I say if you came across this in a garden, you would think it's a far more expensive choice conifer. You would probably think Lime Glow is a canisiparous that I paid two hundred dollars for you know <laughs> i mean when you start getting into those more bespoke conifers they tend to be very expensive this is going to be a shrub that's going to be 39.99 in a two gallon pot i mean you cannot beat that that is amazing um and speaking of which go online i saw that it's for sale at wilson brothers nursery online so that is that is a good source for that particular juniper um it we should also say Juniperus horizontalis is a uh, northern North American native. Um, so this is this is just a selection off of that North American native and um, it's great. I just want to mention um, we have mentioned we did a, an article on junipers um, that was David McKinney actually wrote for us a few issues ago in fine gardening. You can find that online as well. Um, it, I think the title of it was junipers deserve more love. And we did have someone who wrote in who was from a fire prone area who talked about that junipers can be a bit dangerous um, as far as being close to your house in fire prone areas. So I did want to mention that that is a you know a plant that does spark up very very quickly so if you're in a fire prone area um, my northern california folks you probably want to stay away from this plant but in other regions i would say thumbs up and now because everything sounds better with a british accent here's peter to talk about the importance of covers today i want to talk about something that might seem mundane but that hold significant importance in our daily lives. Covers. No, not ground covers. You've already heard enough about those. I'm thinking about the other covers, whether it's beach cover-ups, security blankets, or the ever-elusive lids for Tupperware. Each serves a crucial role in our lives. First, let's talk about beach cover-ups. These simple garments provide more than just modesty. They offer protection from the sun's harsh rays, and give us the confidence to move comfortably between the sand and the streets. A good cover-up is not just a piece of fabric. It's a shield that allows us to enjoy our time at the beach without worrying about exposure. Especially for a melanin-challenged English bloke like me. Next we have the security blanket, the cover on our bed. This isn't just about warmth. A bed cover offers a sense of safety and comfort, wrapping us in a cocoon of care that helps us relax and sleep soundly. It's a simple item that transforms our bed into a sanctuary, a place where we can escape the stresses of the day, like the current bunny war I'm waging in the backyard. Finally, the Tupperware cover. How many times have we rummaged through a cabinet searching for that all-important matching lid? These covers are essential for keeping our food fresh, preventing spills, and making our leftovers last longer. While they might seem trivial, they play a vital role in maintaining the quality of our meals and in reducing food waste. 
Or perhaps I need to rethink this podcasting gig and apply to be a Tupperware spokesperson. In conclusion, covers in their various forms are small but mighty elements of our lives. They provide modesty, security and practicality. So next time you put on a beach cover-up, pull up your bed cover or snap a lid onto your Tupperware, take a moment to appreciate the simple yet significant role these covers play in making our lives a bit more comfortable and secure. Oh yes, and ground covers in the garden are good too. There, are you happy now, Danielle? I managed to bring it back around to plants. Okay, Carol, (laughs) I did get a little chuckle envisioning Peter in a bathing suit cover up. I I don't know why, but that just gave me, that gave me the giggles. (laughs) I, I really think he did. would look very glamorous. Come on now. <laughs> Protecting his his melatonin or his melanin uh, challenge skin. That English man. Oh, too funny. All right. So I'm curious to see what our expert has to say for uncommon ground covers. Hi, I'm Amanda Thompson. I have written the book Kiss My Aster, which is the only graphic novel style choose your own adventures book of home landscaping and i am a horticulturist and i own a plant store in lamont illinois called aster gardens and i'm here to talk to you about ground covers and um i learned i think probably the hard way that a ground cover can be literally anything that covers the ground and i will uh i'll I'll fight you on that Um, i have a couple of fun ground covers I'd like to talk to you about. Um, They're all kind of messy reseeders because that's kind of my thing. And um, I'm excited to tell you about them. Can a seasonal vegetable be a ground cover? Um, In my world, yes, it can. Um, If I need something that's going to hold space in my vegetable garden and make sure that weeds aren't going to come up, then if that plant can do that, I would say that it's a ground cover. So the one I want to talk to you about today is Dietrich's Wild Broccoli Rob. Um, I got mine from Experimental Farm Network, and you need just like one or two seeds, and it will be with you for the rest of your life, um, whether you're into that or not. It uh, comes up in early spring. All parts of it are edible, beautiful yellow flowers, very tasty, very, very prolific. So really it will fill in a whole area like a ground cover. And then um, I pull some of them early because sometimes there's too much and I let some go to seed and I always have a ground cover in that area. And uh, later in the summer um, when it's already burned out, I can plant my beans there. And I think that this is a beautiful way of using a ground cover that is maybe not what you think of. Often when we think of ground covers, we're thinking of low growing, kind of fluffy, just filler plants. And this is the opposite of that, but I like masses of plants. And when um, something is wonderful and as good as it gets, I want 37 to 3,700 of them. And this plant is Cardoon. Um, It is a relative of the artichoke. Uh, the last thing you would think of when you think of ground covers. It has these huge, arching, gray, toothy leaves, um, very spiny. Um, I use it a lot very creatively in areas I don't want people walking or getting into or um, when I am using them in a like a municipal bed, like it's going to keep litter out it's going to keep people from from messing with my you know my planting and i use it that way but in usually it's used as a focal point but i'm saying that this is gorgeous in a mass as a ground cover and again i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the mat saying that if it covers the ground it's a ground cover it totally gives up my age that uh i was thinking of the song naughty girls need love too by samantha fox when i was uh thinking about my next selection which is the chocolate daisy. Um, Lousy soil deserves cool ground covers too. Maybe that, maybe this is a reach, but I'm going with it. So the chocolate daisy, or as I always, I kind of just always call it Berlandiaria. Um, it really does smell like chocolate. It looks like a little, uh, little, you know, member of the Aster family, uh, yellow flowers, low profile. Um, but here's the deal as a ground cover, 
in your lousy soil or like a hot spot. It's it's a tough little reseeder. Um, if you mass it as a ground cover, you will smell chocolate from any point in your yard. And and again, like I'm not combative. I'm, I'm not a combative person, but also with each of my decisions here, I'm like fight me on it. Um, well, I guess we're going to argue about plants. This is such a fun selection for like a maybe like a rocky area or if you live someplace hotter than I do, um, you know, which you may not think that the Chicago area is hot, but man, our summers are wicked. So it's a really good one for um, maybe where there's a lot of uh, hardscaping. Um, it's a good one for, to try literally anywhere and see what happens. And since it does seed out, um, and kind of, you know, seeds out into its own destiny, you could really have a lot of this and let it come back every year. Another uh, unsuspecting ground cover, Econops Ritro, uh, which is globe thistle. Um, it seeds out everywhere and I can't get enough of it. And it's making a beautiful ground cover next to my front door in which my husband asks me constantly if it's a weed and if he can pull it. But you know who doesn't ask me that? It's the finches, um, which I have a lot of. It's great for butterflies. It's great for birds. It looks great dried. If you were to try to buy a, a clump of it that's already dried, you'd be paying like $25 to $30 for it. And I'm saying that this is like practically free. Um, it's a clump forming plant, which makes it perfect for a ground cover. Uh, another nice spiky plant that kind of deters hooliganism. I believe that fine gardening has promised me an extra gift if I was to work in the word hooliganism. Um, so I'll be expecting that in the mail. About four feet tall, uh, nice mm, two to three feet spread, looks great in a mass. Um, those blue steely flowers um, reminding me of the Epcot ball, honestly. Um, the silver arching leaves help keep away uh, any kind of critter you have, like, you know, rabbits, deer, monkeys, whatever, you know, happens in your neighborhood. I don't think it can be beat. Is it uh, an unusual selection? Sure is. But uh, that's kind of my gig. Well, that Amanda Thompson, she never disappoints. I love her plant choices always, and I knew she would be the one to, to give us something really unusual for ground covers, so. Absolutely, absolutely. It's always a hoot. You never know what to expect with her. <laughs>